Um, yeah, so today I'm, uh, so the main topic uh, of this presentation will be the topic of password reuse, but also general statistics on passwords. Um, so first, <coughs> my agenda. So first I motivate the topic, so what's the main problem? Uh, why do we do this analysis? Um, what kind of data do we use for the analysis? Um, some general statistics on the data. Afterwards, uh, like more concrete statistics on the topic of password reuse. And in the last part, we show how we can use this knowledge um, to show that password cracking can be even more improved um, because of password reuse. And in the end, we come to a conclusion. So first of all, um, like the general problems of leaks, um, database leaks, identity leaks, uh, however you call them. Um, so this graph shows you like how many identities are uh, usually leaked every month um, on the internet. And so publicly leaked, everybody can access them, everybody can download them. And um, so I think in a median, there are like five million uh, identities leaked per month. So what's the problem of these leaks? So usually the people that are affected by them, so the, the users that are in these database dumps, they don't know that the data has been leaked. And um, so because not all the leaks are reported in the media, only the very big ones. And even the big ones, uh, not everybody cares about the news. They will only realize if their accounts are actually compromised. And um, yeah, and their uh, money is stolen or uh, the ident their identity is stolen, something like this. And um, so the cyber criminals, they can use this easily. So um, they use the fact that people don't know and they have a lot of time or a big time frame where they can misuse the data until the victims actually uh, realize what has happened. Okay, um, so for this, for, for this general problem, uh, we have created a, um, a service um, for people to, to warn the people um, about identity leaks um, because we came, so we started this project with the Adobe leak in 2013 and um, we were interested how many people from our faculty um, are actually affected by this Adobe leak. And uh, so we wanted to know which people we have to warn in our faculty um, about these leaks. And so this is the start of our service. So when we uh, saw that, okay, now it didn't stop with Adobe, so there were more leaks coming. And uh, we incorporated this into the service and made it accessible to everyone. So this is the service. So um, you can go to this webpage, sec.hbi.de, type in your email, and then you will see uh, whether you're affected um, by an identity leak. Um, yeah, for now, so we started the service in May 2014. Um, until then, uh, 2.7 million people have requested our service. And uh, from these 2.7 million, 270,000 people were actually affected um, by one or the other leak. So this is like 10% of the people are affected. Um, all together now we have uh, 2.5 billion credentials in this service, um, which currently are from 70 different da um, database leaks. And um, yeah, so at the moment we are also collecting other leaks automatically, for example from Pastebin or from other forums or web pages. And uh, all together now we have more than 20,000 leaks, but it's really hard to incorporate into the service because uh, it requires some manual verification um, about our data. Okay, so yeah, based on this uh, service, we had the ability to, um, to actually ha have access to this data and um, to do some tests on this. Okay, now to the problem of uh, password reuse. Um, so there was an interesting report from uh, Verizon in 2016 where they said that 63% uh, of all confirmed data breaches are because of the wrong use of passwords. So this includes uh, password reuse, um, that passwords have been stolen, so also some kind of reuse, or the usage of default passwords. Um, if we look at some of the biggest data leaks that, that, have, that have happened this year, um, Dropbox and LinkedIn, um, so there it's known or not known, but uh, like they assume that these data leaks only happen because of password reuse. So uh, in the case of Dropbox, they assume that one employee actually um, was hacked or their, their credentials uh, were leaked. So this employee's credentials were leaked somewhere in, in another leak. 
And these credentials were then used to access the Dropbox of this employee. And in this Dropbox, there were more information where the attackers were able to access the uh, database of Dropbox. And this again led to another data leak, which can then again be used to, uh, yeah, to compromise more databases. Same for LinkedIn. Um, yeah, another uh, example for this, uh, how password reuse actually affects us. So after this LinkedIn leak and uh, MySpace leak, which happened this year, um, we saw that on uh, Twitter or many social networks, um, like accounts from prominent people um, were taken over because they used or reused their passwords from the MySpace leak. Um, so some examples, for example, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Katy Perry, David Guetta, so all their accounts were um, taken over. And yeah, the general problem of this reuse is everybody talks about it, everybody knows that this is a general problem, but there is no real comprehensive study on this um, or like on a big data set. So it's just an assumption that this is a big problem and uh, we wanted to yeah, confirm this in, in our study. Yes, yeah, so our goal is to, based on the huge data set we uh, have for our service anyhow, um, to create a, a study based on real password or real world um, password data. So the, um, yeah, the advantage we have is that for our service we have to normalize the leaks in a way. So we have to know at which position in the database leaks the, uh, the emails are stored that we can then <coughs> hash and like, make accessible of our web page um, for querying. And uh, we know where the um, passwords are positioned in the leaks so that we know whether a user is actually affected by a, a leaked password or not. And so this normalization we can already use um, for further analysis. Okay, here uh, you see a list of leaks we actually incorporated into our study. So at the point we did the study, um, like not all the currently known uh, database leaks were uh, actually publicly accessible. So for example, Dropbox, which is not part of this. Um, so altogether, we analyzed 31 different uh, leaks. From there, um, 21 databases, it's sure that they, uh, that they came from uh, database dumps. And uh, 10 other leaks, it's not known where they come from. These are just collections of credentials. And uh, so it's not, or it's quite sure that these uh, passwords do not come from the service, but were collected otherwise. So um, what's quite typical is that uh, people try to or take a big database already, then uh, try these credentials on a different side. For example, this was the case, or probably the case for Twitter. So they tried credentials on Twitter, and when they saw that there was a successful login, they collected this into a big database, and then published this uh, database of like successful login as Twitter database. But this is not the database of Twitter, but these are just valid credentials for Twitter. And um, so for the password reuse, you can only use these uh, 21 leaks because they, there you really know that they are not a product of password reuse. Um, yeah, altogether, these 31 different leaks, um, they have 995 million credentials altogether. And um, among these credentials, there are, there are 884 million distinct email addresses in it. Um, from these 884 million, there are 68 million addresses that uh, have an account at least in two of these leaks. So these 68 million addresses actually qualify for a, a analysis on the password reuse. Okay, some general statistics so on the data we collected. Um, so we had a look at the, at the password routines that were used in them. And uh, so on the very right side, you see the dumps, so the 21 I just mentioned. So this is the one uh, that we have to take into account, not the number of leaks. Um, so there you see that 62% uh, of the data leaks actually store their password insecurely. This means either clear text, MD5, or SHA-1. So because MD5 and SHA-1 it's pretty easy to uh, look it up in the internet and find the right uh, password behind it. So, yeah. Um, only 30% of the 
of the, uh, of the databases use more secure mechanisms, like uh, combining MD5 and SHA-1 with assault, but still it's possible to recover a large amount of passwords um, yeah, uh, for, for these uh, routines. And uh, only one service actually used a secure password storing mechanism, which is really scary. Um, okay, so um, when we look at the passwords uh, that were included, so this didn't only contain clear text passwords, but also hashed passwords, um, as we just saw. And uh, so around 50% of the passwords were actually uh, password hashes. And um, because we cannot compare or we cannot use this data for uh, the password reuse or general password analysis, um, we looked into common ways on how to like um, get from the hashes uh, to the password. And so here are like four main methods we have used. So uh, first of all, you can use rainbow tables, larger rainbow tables for looking up passwords. But this is only uh, like possible for <coughs> passwords that happen really often um, because it's a really time consuming task to look up the, uh, hashes in a, a rainbow table. Um, also for passwords that you find quite often, you can use uh, Google to look them up. So because many people already try to recover passwords from, from hashes. And if you just type in a, a hash on Google, you will find the clear text passwords in many cases. Um, for the majority of the passwords, uh, you can come to uh, hash cracking web pages. So there are web pages that where this community um, is cracking passwords basically the whole day. And um, they are distributing the cracked passwords in the forums. And this you can download and then like compare it to the hashes you have. So in, um, in this case, for many larger leaks, you find um, like huge listings of all the cracked passwords in it. So uh, for example, for MySpace, uh, I think up to now, um, 99 or even more uh, of the passwords uh, have been cracked, 99%. Um, OK. Yeah, and um, what we also did is for, um, so for, for um, passwords, for um, a hashed email address, um, where there was one clear text password at least, we tried this clear text password also for the uh, hashed variants of um, the same hashed email. So this allows us to uh, like better um, conclude the password we use. Okay, so this is the number of, uh, or the percentages um, shown and also the number of clear text passwords for each of the leaks we could recover by these methods. Um, so all together, we were able to um, like recover 85% of all the passwords in clear text. Um, altogether, this is uh, 848 million credentials in clear text. And altogether, this covers 320 million different passwords. Okay, so now we have the clear text passwords. And um, yeah, now we did different analysis on it. So first of all, the length analysis. Um, we did this for the distinct passwords and the individual passwords. Um, so individual means um, a password, like if um, one password was used by 10 users, then um, the distinct would be uh, one time and the individual one would be 10 times. So uh, yeah, there you see like the majority of passwords is actually in the range of, um, of eight, uh, character length eight. And the reason for this is that at the moment still the recommendation for the an optimal password is eight characters, which we know is not the best recommendation, but this is probably what many users think is right. So they exactly take eight characters um, as their length. Um, for the character distribution um, of these passwords, we see that 56% uh, of the passwords are actually alphanumerical. And um, <coughs> so this you can see on the left side, you see um, which character classes are included in a password. And uh, on the right side, you see which sequence of character classes appear in the password. And so that's quite interesting that 39% um, of all the passwords are actually alphas followed by digits. So the typical password one or password one, two, three. 
Okay, like the top passwords, not so interesting, so or nothing, uh, nothing so new. Um, you see that uh, many of the passwords are actually uh, going back to keyboard walks or some sort of keyboard walk, and um, so all this is like quite easy to or like draw a line on the keyboard, um, except uh, phrases like password and uh, I love you. Okay, for the password reuse, coming now to this topic, um, we use two approaches to look at this. Um, one is to uh, find identical passwords that are used among uh, one email and uh, similar passwords. Because uh, we know that some users are advanced and don't only use the identical password, but like use, for example, the, uh, the current year at the end. So that we also wanted to cover in some way. And uh, that's we also considered the similar passwords. Um, for the password similarity, we use the uh, Levenstein distance, um, which is like the easiest to calculate and uh, still like gives a, yeah, a proper value uh, where you can work with. So this Levenstein distance basically shows you how many modifications have been done on the passwords, how many insertions, um, delete, uh, deletions, and uh, substitutions have been applied on the password. So here on the right, you see an example uh, for this password and password, uh, password one, where uh, the, the S has been replaced by a dollar sign and um, the O replaced by zero. And here the distance would be four. And if you, uh, yeah, and if you take this number and uh, divide it by the, the maximum length of the password, you uh, receive a relative uh, scoring um, for this distance. So this means a password that's 100% identical has a score of 100% uh, or one, and um, <coughs> yeah, a, ten, uh, um, a password of uh, length 10 where three characters have been modified has a, uh, has a score of 70% or 0.7. Okay, and so because many or there, there are some users um, which are available in like multiple sites, five, six, seven uh, sites, um, we had to find a way to find passwords or clusters of passwords which are similar. Um, because it might be that some users use multiple passwords for different sites, and uh, yeah, these clusters of passwords we want to detect. So that's why we. Uh, use graphs for this, or weighted graphs in this case. Um, in this case, um, the nodes of the, graph, uh, of the graph are a password with its source, and the edges of, the, of two passwords, or of two password nodes, um, indicate the similarity, or the, Levenstein, uh, or the relative Levenstein distance. And um, to find similar and identical passwords, we basically put a mask on this graph, where we say, okay, uh, now give us all the subgraphs where each of the nodes are, all of the uh, nodes are connected um, with an edge that is at least over a certain threshold. So uh, for identical passwords, the threshold would be uh, 1.0 or 100%. And um, for the similarity, um, we show the value of 70%. Um, so there we said the value must be larger or equal to uh, 70%. So finding this, um, these clusters uh, can be done like with typical graph algorithms, um, finding clicks in the graph. Okay, um, so based on these 68 million uh, email addresses we have analyzed um, that uh, have at least two credentials, we found out that for identical passwords, so for a similarity score of 100%, 20% um, of the users on average use identical credentials over multiple pages. Um, so in 60,000 users from this uh, 68 million actually use the same password over more than four sources. <coughs> um, for similar passwords, so with a similarity score of 70%, um, it's 27% uh, of the users. 
Okay, now a more detailed overview of the similarities. So uh, what we did is, um, because this is like a general score, like an um, average score, this 20%. And uh, so we know that some pages have much higher uh, reuse scores, actually. So that's why we compared each source with each source. And so what's quite interesting, so I marked a few here, um, which can be combined to a certain cluster of websites. And the blue one, which is Chinese sites, and um, the red one for dating sites. And if you see the similarity scores there, for Chinese, for example, you see that um, there is 61 to, or even 70% of password reuse for Chinese sites. And uh, also for dating sites, there are much higher reuse rates than the typical 20%. They are like 45%, 40, 42%, 40%. Um, so that's quite scary, actually. All right. Um, yeah, another start or another analysis we did is based on the on the regional passwords. <coughs> so when we analyzed the the passwords, we also extracted the top level domain uh, from the emails and like did a listing for um, unique passwords for uh, top level domains. So basically, we calculated the top 1,000, the general top 1,000 passwords, and extracted um, from the regional ones, extracted the top 1,000 from these, and in the end, there were only the ones that are really specific to the country. And yeah, what's quite interesting, so for uh, UK, that there are the football clubs, um, certain names that are typical for the country, um, for the German one, that uh, there's a, yeah, like the keyboard layout you can see. Um, yeah. Ah, so maybe one or like a few specifics on uh, Chinese and Russian passwords. What you can see is, so Russian and Chinese passwords are, have a lot of numbers in it. And for Russians, what we can observe is that uh, basically the Russians have their a uh, Kyrillic keyboard in front of them, typing uh, their like Kyrillic passwords on it, but in the computer they have the uh, US keyboard layout um, selected. So when they type their password, in the end the uh, a few like random characters appear because uh, like the mapping is completely different. And uh, if you see the password or the top passwords of uh, of Russian users, uh, you will think that these are random character strings. They don't make any sense. But if you know this fact, then you know what password is behind it. Um, for Chinese ones, uh, what they have, so you see here like 5201314. Uh, um, this is actually, an, if you pronounce password, or if you pronounce numbers in, um, or these numbers in Chinese, it sounds like uh, something, um, I love you, or um, like you are my only one. And yeah. So these are like love related passwords. Same as this uh, Yini. OK, based on this knowledge, um, and I told you that there's one uh, leak which actually used uh, strong password hashes. This was um, the Ashley Madison leak, um, which has bcrypt with a cost factor of 12. And um, what this means is if you try to brute force bcrypt, um, you will have uh, like rates of around 10 to 100 um, calculated hashes per second, which is extremely slow. And so this means if you want to only like to check the top 100 against Ashley Madison, this can take maybe multiple years. And um, yeah, so this is not really reasonable to crack passwords in the traditional manner for Ashley Madison. And there was one uh, article by um, the Sinoshore team um, who tried to attack these hashes. And what they did, they used the weakness in this leak. So Ashley Madison, in a, like in some older times, they stored some passwords in MD5 or in a modified <laughs> MD5 version. So they, uh, they lower cased all the passwords and calculated the MD5 password from it. And uh, so to, fi to find out the real password, you basically have to try all the variations. Because it was lowercase, you have to try all the variations with uppercases to find the real password. 
because in the new version they uh, accounted for the um, the casing, so they didn't lowercase. And so first they cracked the MD5 hashes with the lowercase version, and uh, then tried all the uppercase uh, variations um, with bcrypt. So like for some password, like if you say, um, well, uh, so this means for uh, each password you have to only check a few passwords in bcrypt in the end. So in using this approach they were able to recover 2.1 million passwords from this leak. Okay, what we tried now is, so based on the, um, on the leaks we have already and uh, the Cleartex passwords we had already, we tried to, uh, like for the users, um, they were stored in Ashley Madison to find um, passwords in other leaks and uh, checked whether this password is actually the same as uh, the one that was stored in bcrypt. And yeah, using this approach, we were able to uh, recover 2.9 million passwords only in a few hours because we only had to check more or less two or three passwords um, for each of these users and yeah, if there was a match then <coughs> you immediately see the result. And this also shows that uh, password reuse th does not even protect against like strong cryptography or uh, strong uh, password hashes. Um, you still have to use different um, credentials for different sites even if they securely store their passwords. Okay, like our conclusion. So we have provided a, a password study that's basically um, working on a few hundred millions of passwords. Um, yeah, the main topic or the main focus here was the topic of password reuse because it's like a myth, everybody talks about it, but nobody knows the real numbers from it. And we found out that on average 20% of the users reuse their passwords. 27 use similar passwords and similar sites even have much higher rates than this. Yeah, password reuse is a serious problem and even if you use strong hashing, um, it doesn't help you um, for the security of your password. And people should really care about using different passwords on different web pages. Okay. That's it for the presentation.